Ladies and gentlemen, my name is George Danos and I am the president of CSU. In the next decades, space exploration is set to grow in a profound way. That is why we have asked some of the top experts in cosmology, astronomy and space engineering to share with us their views on what the future in space exploration will bring the next decade up to 2030. We premiered our series on September 8th with a legend of cosmology, Sir Roger Penrose. Today, for our second episode, we continue our series with a brilliant expert on the exploration of the Moon. We are honoured to have with us Dr. Jonathan Eastwood, Director of Imperial College's Space Lab. And next month, we have Professor Marcello Corradini, Head of Solar System Exploration of ESA, who led space missions for over two decades. For more details, visit space.cy slash spaceworks where you will read all the lineup coming up in the next months. So, let us now concentrate on our special guest of today's webinar, Dr. Jonathan Eastwood. Dr. Eastwood is the director of the Imperial College London Space Lab, the umbrella network of all space-related research in the college. He's also a senior lecturer in the Blackett Laboratory and a member of the Space and Atmospheric Physics Research Group. His background includes working at the University of California, Berkeley, and NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, Greenbelt MD, where he held a National Research Council Resident Research Associateship. From 2010 to 2014, he held an STFC Advanced Fellowship at Imperial College London. In 2012, Jonathan was one of the recipients of the Kospar Zeldovich Medal. Ladies and gentlemen, we are truly delighted to have Dr. Eastwood with us today. After his presentation, we will answer questions which you may post as comments under this stream, either on YouTube or Facebook. So, let us first watch Dr. Eastwood's presentation. Hello, my name is Dr. Jonathan Eastwood and I work at Imperial College London in the Department of Physics. I'm also the director of the Space Lab, which is the umbrella network for all space research activity at Imperial. I'm here today to talk about uh, moon exploration and settlement, and in particular, the return to the moon, the risks, the challenges, and the new scientific frontiers. In this talk, I'm gonna talk about uh, beginning a little bit with lunar exploration history, and we'll talk about what has happened in the past. I'm then going to talk about uh, what makes exploration so difficult, and in particular, the one thing that we can't control, which is the sun. And this is related to an area called space weather. I'm then going to spend some time telling you about the new and exciting things that are going on in the future of lunar space exploration, what's happening now, and what will be happening in the next five to 10 years. And after that, I want to show you some really interesting experiments that can be done from the moon that would really transform our scientific understanding and perhaps reveal some of the most important things about the history of the universe. At the end, I'll take a few minutes to go beyond the moon and talk about uh, exploration of Mars in particular and some of the things that are going on there. But to begin, I want to show you some of the most iconic footage uh, from uh, the 1960s and 70s uh, of when we landed on the moon. Um, uh, at the foot of the ladder, the Lambert beds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches, uh, although the surface appears to be uh, very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. And then a long one. Okay, I'm going to leave that one foot up there and uh, both hands 
I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. And so what we were watching there, of course, was the Apollo 11 landing. And I think it's fair to say it captured the world's attention, it inspired a generation. And uh, although many millions of words have been written about the Apollo program, the many podcasts, movies, books, so on and so forth, especially with it being the 50th anniversary very recently, I think it's worth just pausing to reflect on what an amazing achievement it was. So at the beginning of the 60s, President Kennedy committed uh, the United States to uh, landing a man on the moon and returning him before the decade was out. And so the whole Apollo program was uh, to achieve that. And so there was a series of increasingly complicated uh, technical missions that culminated in the Apollo 11 landing. And then there were six uh, moon landings. And so the movie that we have here is from Apollo 16, uh, the penultimate mission. And when we're watching this, we have the sense of new horizons, of the new footsteps of exploration heading out into the solar system. And yet at the time we're watching this, the time this happened, in fact, Apollo was already over because two years earlier in 1970, it had already been decided to cancel the Apollo 18, 19 and 20 missions. And so the reasons for that there are many, but of course, the primary one probably being the cost. And so this was a very expensive program. And it's also related to the idea, you know, Apollo is held up as a excellent mission statement to send a man to the moon and return uh, before the decade is out. And of course, Apollo had achieved its mission. And so we've been to the moon and come back safely. And so I think at the time, Probably nobody would have believed it would still be 50 years later and no one else would have walked on the surface of the moon. But in fact, that's what happened. And indeed, um, you know, we see the pictures of uh, Apollo 17 and the final astronaut here. And then um, we look at what happened next. And the image that you can see now is of the uh, Soviet uh, Lunokhod 2 rover. And this as you see, it looks very much like the forefathers of the rovers that you've probably seen on Mars in particular. And so what this represents actually is a pivot from human exploration to robotic exploration, where all of the major results studying the planets, um, asteroids and other objects in the solar system over the last several decades has been strongly driven by robotic exploration with probes like Cassini, uh, Saturn or the Mars rovers that I've talked about. So that's what had happened in the past in lunar exploration, the highlight being Apollo. I want to now spend a few minutes talking about why space exploration is hard. And in particular, the one thing of all the many things that are difficult is the one thing we can't control, which is the sun. And so what I'm going to show next in this slide is a picture of the sun. When we see it at sunrise or sunset, it's a featureless object. It looks like it's not changing a constant source of heat and light for life on Earth. And so uh, that's how we tend to think of the sun. But it's not really like that. And the first hint that you might get is shown in the next slide, looking at um, a solar eclipse. Now, in this case, this is when the moon, which just happens to be a similar size to the sun in the sky and when the moon comes in front of the sun it blocks out the direct light from the sun and then we can see the sun's atmosphere which is called the corona and looking at this image we can see a lot of structure and actually that's governed by the sun's magnetic field and the magnetic field traps the material which is a plasma and so we can see this trapped glowing material forming these very complicated structures now when you look at it with an eclipse on the ground, it lasts only a few minutes. And again, it could look rather unchanging and static. But if we go into space and watch it continuously with satellites, then a 
a much different picture emerges. And that's shown in the next slide, which is a movie from a spacecraft called Solar Dynamics Observatory. This is actually looking not at the sun with our eyes and not with visible light, but with the spacecraft size in ultraviolet light. And in fact, the way that this movie is made is that it contains three different wavelengths, each of a different color that are placed on top of each other. And then you make a time lapse movie by adding together all of the different images. And if you look in the bottom left of the uh, movie, you can see the clock running faster than real time. We see the sun rotating. And as we watch this movie, what we can see is a seething, boiling mass of plasma. And on top of that, we can see structure in the atmosphere. These are associated, in fact, with sunspots and uh, we see bright regions. And occasionally we see eruptions and explosions and brightenings. And so I want to talk about that in a little bit more detail. On the next slide, um, this is another movie from Solar Dynamics Observatory. And in this case, we're going to zoom in just on a small part of the surface. What we can see here are called magnetic loops in the solar atmosphere, and they're filled with uh, hot plasma. And you can see flashes of light. And some of these are so bright that they saturate the camera. And those are solar flares. Solar flares are eruptions which cause huge flashes of light across the electromagnetic spectrum from X-rays through radio to, and in between. Um, and these are a source also of very energetic particles. Particles like protons can get accelerated to relativistic energies, that travel out through space with the light from the flare. And this is an example of something which we have to be concerned about when we are planning, for example, human exploration. It's an example of something called space weather, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a few minutes. But before I do so, I want to show you a different type of solar eruption and this is something called a coronal mass ejection. And this is an enormous eruption of material from the sun that travels out into space at a thousand kilometers a second, a huge bubble of material. And these also can contain energetic particles. And they also represent something that we have to consider when we're looking at exploration. Now, I mentioned the word space weather. And this is uh, in this slide showing uh, a definition or an explanation from the uh, UK uh, risk register. And so as it says in the text, just as we have weather on Earth, we have weather in space. And these are driven, these weather in space, space weather is driven by the sun. And in particular, the things that I showed you like solar flares and coronal mass ejections, these can travel through space and they can interact with our modern technological world, both on the ground and in space. And that's summarized by uh, this next picture, which shows some of the ways in which space weather, so the activity on the sun that we just saw, can affect life here on Earth. Now, we'll be mainly interested in things happening at the top of the picture because that's relevant for going back to the moon. So particles can come, they can charge uh, sensitive electronics inside satellites, uh, they can embed themselves in the delicate microelectronics, cause memory upsets, they can stop the computer from working, they can damage the solar cells as well. So there's lots of things that can happen with these events that can be harmful for satellites and technology in space, can also be harmful for astronauts. And so the astronauts on the space station, for example, and the space shuttle previously would pay close attention to solar activity so they understood what was going on. Space weather, I should say, also is very important down here on Earth and it's a major uh, research interest of my own, uh, own group, uh, looking in particular at the impact on power grids. But we're gonna be thinking about how this is relating to the moon and to exploration. Now, in the next picture, this is a little bit more complicated. I'll take a couple of minutes to walk through it just to illustrate why it's important for lunar exploration. So along the bottom, that's time going along from 1955 through to 1985, that's about 30 years, and the smooth line going up and down represents the number of sunspots on the surface of the sun, 
And that tells us about something called the solar cycle. So the sun has about an 11 year period uh, of uh, periodicity with activity going up and down. So the sunspot cycle, the sunspot's number increases, then it goes down. Um, and this happened three times in this image. On top of that, there are lots of vertical lines of different heights, and those represent different types of different space weather events of the type that would produce very energetic particles, which could be harmful to satellites or indeed astronauts. And you can see that they tend to clump around the peaks in solar in the sunspot cycle, but um, they can also occur in the minimum as well. And the last part of this image are the seven smaller vertical lines in the middle towards the top, A11 to A17. And as you may have guessed, those correspond to the seven Apollo missions. Um, and as we saw, Apollo 16, Apollo 17. And in between those two on the right hand side, I think you should be able to see a very tall peak in a, pro a solar event, which happened right between Apollo 16 and 17. And so it didn't happen during an Apollo mission, but a considerable amount of work has been done by the scientific community to try and understand what would have happened if that event had happened during an Apollo mission. And whilst nothing can be completely conclusive, I think there's general consensus that had such an event occurred during the mission, perhaps while the astronauts were on the surface of the moon, uh, protected only by their spacesuits, then there could have been very severe consequences indeed. And so this just underlines the fact that going to the moon is not just difficult technologically, but you have to be aware of the environment that you're in and you have to monitor space weather. And so today um, there's an international effort to understand and forecast space weather to better mitigate its effects, because after all, we can't control the sun. And so we have to live with whatever the sun will do. The figure that I'm showing now is a cartoon, not to scale, showing the sun on the left and the earth up in the top right. Purple represents the earth's magnetic field, the magnetosphere. And I'm just showing this to give you an illustration of how we envisage a fleet of satellites in space, monitoring the space environment, monitoring space weather, part of its job being to uh, feed into the exploration uh, activity. The L1 satellite actually is already existing for a long time, and at the moment the Discover spacecraft operated by NOAA and uh, NASA is filling that role. The L5 satellite is something under development, and in this next picture it shows it as the Lagrange spacecraft. This is a European Space Agency project which here at Imperial we're involved with in helping develop some of the instrumentation, in particular the magnetic field instrument. We're currently in the early stages of designing Lagrange. We hope that in the next five or so years it will be built and then launched into space where it will play a role in monitoring interplanetary space and looking at what happens going from the sun to the earth from a side view. And that will play an important role in uh, understanding the uh, space environment for exploration. So having talked about monitoring the space environment, I now want to talk a bit more about what's going on with lunar exploration today. And so um, the first image I have here is a panorama, an amazing panorama from the uh, Chang'e 4 lander. Now this was the first soft landing on the far side of the moon. And you'll have also noticed the rover there as well. And so this really represents a returned scientific focus on the moon, a leading edge of a big international effort to go back to understand the moon better, but also to do new um, exploration. Also in this regard, I wanted to show the launch. Uh, this is a launch of the uh, Chandrayaan-2 mission. Again, you may have heard about this. The orbiter is currently in orbit around the moon. I read to do more than seven years of observations. There was also a rover, unfortunately, in the hovering stage of the landing. Uh, there was a problem, but uh, this is definitely as part of a program with renewed interest in the moon and new missions to come um, in the future. Now, I want to spend a few minutes talking about uh, the Artemis program from NASA. 
I imagine that if you're watching, this may be something that you've heard of before. Uh, what we're looking at at the moment are some images from Apollo. And then looking forward, uh, we'll talk a bit about the Artemis program because this is about human return uh, to the moon. And so uh, what we will see is that the architecture is quite similar to um, Apollo, but there are also very significant differences. And so looking as the movie goes on, we see the Earth is about three days away. And now we're going to see a little bit about how Artemis is planned to work. So Artemis will carry a crew of four and they'll be in the Orion uh, crew module. And this will be accompanied by a service module, which is actually a contribution from the European Space Agency. And this together will be launched um, using a new rocket, which you may have heard of, which is called uh, the Space Launch System. And if we look at the Space Launch System side by side uh, with Apollo, then we can see that they are very reminiscent of each other. And so this is because you need a very large rocket to deliver something on the way to the moon and to take enough equipment as well. And so as this movie goes on, we will see the launch and then I'll talk a little bit more about how it uh, will operate in lunar orbit. So at this point in the movie, the SLS has launched and now Orion is heading into Earth orbit. Uh, we can see that it is now orbiting and the first thing is to check out and make sure that everything is okay. Um, once this checks have been passed, then it's safe to go for the moon, to leave Earth orbit and then travel through the space between the Earth and the moon and arrive at the moon. And that's what we'll watch next. As Orion heads towards the moon, what we see here is the arrival and the comparison with Apollo. Apollo took everything it needed for a single mission so that it could go and return safely. The architecture of um, Artemis is very different with the concept of pre-staging, that there will already have been missions to leave things on the surface of the moon that will be needed. And these include things like rovers, science experiments, and human rated systems that are safe and reliable for people to use. The next thing that we see is called the Lunar Gateway. And this will be like a space station in orbit around the moon as a modular construction, very much with heritage from the International Space Station. In the beginning, it will be just a few modules and it's in a polar orbit around the moon. And it's also in a very elliptical orbit. So it goes very close and then far away. And this is different from Apollo, where Apollo is a more equatorial oriented uh, program. So as the Lunar Gateway orbits the moon, first of all, a service module arrives. And this is carrying equipment that can be used and arrives before the uh, astronauts themselves arrive. And then as the astronauts arrive, it will the uh, Orion uh, will dock with the Lunar Gateway. The astronauts will go into the gateway and then they will descend in a separate module to the lunar surface. And in this concept, the astronauts are heading to the South Pole. It's a very, very interesting region scientifically. It's also practically a very important region because of the nature of the moon's orbit. You've got regions of permanent light, which then means you have permanent power and regions of permanent darkness which means that you have frozen water, ice and resources. And so this is a good place to operate from for a sustained presence on the moon. As I've been talking, as the movie goes along, we've seen the astronauts return to the gateway and then they use the Orion to travel back from the moon to the Earth. And in the final part of this movie, we see the service module uh, detaching and then a re-entry that very much looks like Apollo and finally, we will see the parachutes deploy and then a splashdown landing back on Earth. 
So at this point, I'm going to move along to the next image, which is from the European Space Agency. And this is a graphic showing the service module and the crew module together. And I just wanted to show to give you a sense for the size of this. And uh, as I said, it will hold four people. And this will be the primary vehicle taking people from the Earth to the moon. The next slide shows the concept for the gateway. And what I wanted to highlight here is that this is going to be a really international effort. There's an idea that this will have lots of different uh, contributions from different agencies and countries around the world. Initially, it'll be quite small, but as it uh, grows, it'll have more and more capability. Um, there's also uh, a group called the Moon Village, and the Moon Village Association is designed to help coordinate all different types of lunar uh, exploration so that there can be a harmonious exploration of the moon with everybody working to it together to achieve common scientific goals, but also uh, in collaboration as well. And I should say as well that whilst lunar or all space exploration is complicated and uh, so designs have to change in response to different challenges. So the gateway might not in the end look exactly like this, but this is very much the template and the philosophy which currently governs its development. Now, the last slide I wanted to show about the gateway is uh, showing uh, the first two scientific investigations, which uh, will fly aboard the gateway are related to space weather and monitoring the sun's radiation environment. It's of particular interest to us at Imperial because um, part of our instrumentation is planned to be in this payload, in particular measuring magnetic fields using our miniaturized magnetometer technology. So one big difference between Artemis and Apollo is the idea of going for a more sustained presence at the moon. And that allows a different level of scientific investigation. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the really amazing and interesting science that we could do from this perspective. First thing relates actually to how we would have a presence and in particular, how can we use the resources of the moon in maintaining that presence. So how do we produce oxygen on the moon? And what material, the regolith, that's the, the lunar soil, can be used to do that? And what's the best way to process it? And so a colleague of mine, Catherine Hadler, uh, with her group is looking at how you can take stuff we know from Earth uh, and transplant that to the lunar environment. And this is tremendously important for having sustained presence, also understanding about uh, the chemistry and the geophysics of the moon. Another example that I want to show is about understanding the geophysics of the moon, or the, the physics of the lunar uh, body, where it came from, its history, and how it was made, and then what that tells us about the solar system. So a colleague of mine, Heli Hirtala, in, uh, in the physics department, has been looking with colleagues throughout the college about a proposed network for resource mapping. And in particular, what happens here is using little sensors that can communicate with each other in some sort of distributed kind of Wi-Fi network. They're deployed by a rover and they all talk to orbiting spacecraft. And we can use this network to study regions of the moon and understand the geophysics, understand therefore the history and also understand the materials and uh, do some mapping of, uh, of the properties of the local terrain. The last uh, one I want to highlight today is quite different, and this is really exciting and interesting, absolutely transformative for understanding the history of the universe and our place in it. And this is the idea of using the moon to make a, a radio telescope that could peer back into some of the most interesting parts of the universe's evolution. We've heard in the last talk about the history of the universe and so it's gone through different phases and in particular the so-called dark ages where material had recombined to form hydrogen but had not yet clumped together and ignited to form the first stars and then sort of re-illuminate uh, the universe. It turns out there's a very interesting uh, signal which is called 21 centimeter line of neutral hydrogen that could be used to map this time but because it happened so long ago, it's shifted down to uh, radio frequencies. 
And the radio frequencies of interest is very hard to measure from the surface of the Earth and also strongly contaminated by a modern technological world. And so to make the extraordinarily sensitive and precise measurements you would need, you need to go to a radio quiet area and the best place would be on the far side of the moon. And so what we can see on the left hand side here is a concept for a large lunar uh, radio telescope in a crater where the wires are suspended in the crater. And this could provide the opportunity to peer back into the history of the universe and really understand some of the most fundamental questions about how the universe has evolved. My colleague Jonathan Pritchard in astrophysics is heavily involved in developing this with many colleagues around the world. In terms of exploration, the next figure I wanted to show um, is about how the sustained presence might look. And this is a bit more speculative it's from ESA and also the architects Foster and Partners showing what a lunar base might look like. The important thing to notice here is whilst it's constructed from components brought from Earth, it's also constructed using the materials on the Moon. And the idea of 3D printing on the Moon using lunar regolith and soil and putting it over um, the habitat to make it safe. And this comes back actually to what I was talking about earlier with space weather, where you want to design a habitat that will protect the astronauts from all of the ravages of the space environment whether it's space weather or anything else. And so this is one idea which is getting a lot of traction. And I think looking at how you can use the lunar material to print the space that astronauts could have a sustained presence is really important for then enabling all of this amazing um, scientific discovery that could happen from the moon. So having talked about the moon, I wanna spend the last few minutes just talking about a bit further afield, I'm talking about Mars, because that is often said as the next step of exploration. Now, because of the orbits of Moon, of Mars and the Earth, every two years there's an alignment, which is the best time to, spend, to send probes to Mars. And in particular, you may have noticed in the last few months, three probes went to Mars, which are listed here on the screen. And so I want to talk a little bit about why Mars is interesting and what that motivates. And to do that, the next picture is an image from space of the surface of Mars, part of the surface. It's a false color image where bluer is lower down, red is higher up. And what we see are craters and we see chasms. And this is just one element of the evidence that tells us that a long time, billions of years ago, Mars was wet and warm and now we know it's arid and dry and the evidence that I, you can see here is the Morella crater which is in the center towards the bottom of the image and that was once full of water and then the edge of the crater collapsed on the right hand side you see a little blue channel the water flooded out where that broke and carved moving from left to right the bluish region which is where you can see exactly looks like water flow in the Alava Valles. And this is just one element of the evidence for water on Mars. There are many others looking at the geological record. And so naturally this leads to the question of life and looking for evidence of past life, in particular on Mars, where would it be seen? Because discovering that would completely transform our understanding of, uh, of our place in the universe. Now, at the moment, we've done that with rovers. And if you remember back to earlier in the presentation, the Lunokhod 2 rover, these are its descendants here now on Mars, will be on Mars. So the top uh, left is the Perseverance rover, which is on its way. Uh, I mentioned uh, we have involvement here in the field, Professor Sanjeev Gupta and Professor Mark Sefton. Um, coming up in the next few years will be the Rosalind Franklin rover from the European Space Agency. And that is expected to go in the next uh, launch opportunity in a couple of years. Another really interesting mission is InSight. That's not a rover, it's a lander. But if we play uh, the video at the bottom, Mars InSight carries incredibly sensitive um, in, uh, seismometers, and these are able to measure um, Mars quakes. And so I'm going to be quiet for a few seconds so that you can listen and hear the Mars quakes detected by InSight. 
Now, obviously, up to now, our exploration of Mars has been with rovers, but there is considerable interest in studying whether people will go back to Mars. And we participated in an event at the Design Museum earlier this year, looking at that here in London. Mars is much, much further away, and it's very, very difficult to send people to Mars. But talking with my colleague, Professor Gupta, who's a geologist, about studying the geology of Mars, and he was describing to me the difference between doing it with a rover or exploring with a person. And a person here on Earth doing geology goes to a new terrain, can look around and spot the things that you've not seen before, and uh, the opportunity for serendipitous discovery, for doing things on the fly, for doing things that only people can do. There's still a very strong driver for one day having people go to Mars to really try and understand its history and, uh, and so other things like that. That's very much in the far future. I couldn't put a number on when that's going to happen, but I think it certainly is, is in our future. So that brings me to the end of this presentation. And so I want to show the final slide just to have a few concluding thoughts. When I think about Apollo, actually the most important image from Apollo is arguably the one that we're looking at now. It was taken from Apollo 8, it's called Earthrise. And it's the image where we see the Earth and everybody on it suspended in space. And this really brings home the fact that the Earth is a fragile object hanging in the blackness of space. And it gives us a new understanding of its importance and how we should treat it and look after it and so on and so forth. And equally with talking about exploration, often the conversation at some point will talk about the cost. Should we do it? Is it worth doing? And it's important to recognize it's not just about learning new things out there, but it's also about the benefits that it brings back here on Earth. And so a lot of the stuff that we learn about in space, a lot of the things that we do, a lot of the technology that it drives, there's a lot of relevance for improving life here on Earth, as well as in things like Earth observation and monitoring as well. And so as we go back to the moon, that will generate a lot more scientific progress and more use of space, which will then trickle back into other use of space directed to here on Earth. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. We talked about uh, the history, a little bit of lunar exploration, about why the space environment makes it difficult and what we're doing to understand space weather. We looked at a few different things that are going on in future exploration and in the next five to 10 years, I would expect there'll be much more in terms of lunar exploration. And we finished a little bit talking about Mars. So I hope you found it interesting. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you. Thank you very much.